Again, how's that? Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to uh, uh, sign the attendance record, and also please remember to fill out the program evaluation. If you could, please give us uh, any uh, ideas that you might have in regards to future speakers, uh, future uh, topics. The CME committee is always interested in uh, those ideas. Uh, today, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Voigt. Uh, Dr. Voigt is a gastroenterologist and hepatologist. He is a professor of medicine at the University of Iowa in gastroenterology and hepatology, and he directs the uh, liver failure and liver uh, transplantation service there. And he is here today to update us uh, on the management of cirrhosis in 2013. And please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Voigt. Well, thanks very much for uh, the invitation to speak here. Um, before I get started, can I just ask who of you are kind of general internal medicine? Just a show of hands. And gastroenterologists? And so the rest are at a family practice? Is in family practice? So I'm just trying to gauge about what kind of, um, and residents? So basically, all of you do anything other than that surgery. <laughs> I'm trying to get an idea about what you do. OK, so um, I'm going to cover a lot of ground today. Um, and it's been, it turns out that there are a lot of deficits when people actually go looking at quality of care, um, that there are a lot of deficits in what are recommended and what gets done. So about 77% of people, for example, don't get vaccinated appropriately. About 65% of people will not get antibody prophylaxis, get a follow-up endoscopy, or get a transplant referral. Transplant referrals, only 21% of people that potentially are eligible by guidelines. So what I'm going to do today, as far as learning objectives are concerned, is um, update about liver failure and uh, cirrhosis. Um, I gave a talk here about two years ago. I'm not going to reprise that. Uh, sorry, I will reprise that very briefly, going over the um, in less detail, but just ref um, re um, refreshing what I've said before. But what I would like to do also do is introduce some new concepts, including the concept of acute and chronic liver failure, which is in fact very important and uh, predictive of high mortality. Talk about hepatorenal syndrome, um, new concepts and new definitions which have come through. Um, once again, go over the basics of uh, transplant indications. Now, UNOS rules are changing, and in fact, there are a lot of changes coming down the pike. There's so many other things in the world that we live in, apart from all these kind of care organizations, but UNOS is also doing its own thing about allocation and everything else, and that may affect the way we get things and how you get your patients taken care of. And once, then I'll go over the basics of, of um, transplant, of, of liver management again, and um, talk about a few other things. So one of the th recommendations I have for everybody who does see patients with liver disease is to look at this paper, uh, um, which is basically a consensus document that literally within one or two sentences goes over all the recommendations and some sort of level of, uh, um, of uh, evidence to um, basically guide um, practitioners on what's expected or what should be done in patients with liver disease. And a lot of what I'm going to be doing will be based on these uh, quality uh, metrics um, in the care of patients with cirrhosis. So let's just start off with the first topic, which is um, um, what the UNIS rules are that are changing. Now, rec you'll recall that the, the MELD score, which I've demonstrated here, uh, is a um, regression analysis score that shows mortality, the expectation of mortality in uh, patients with um, cirrhosis. And um, as you can see, as, as the MELD score gets up to 40, is 100% mortality at three months. And what's new is that um, UNOS is changing to what is now the MELD sodium, which incorporates uh, serum sodium. Now, it turns out that uh, sodium is an additional factor in the MELD score which uh, assists in predicting uh, mortality risk. And uh, to date, the MELD score has only included, do you recall what the MELD score includes? So it includes creatinine, bilirubin, and INR, right? So if you now include the sodium, it actually increases the accuracy. Um, the uh, committee that sat, and I was actually on that committee, Jeremy. 
um, actually um, debated long and hard about um, how low the sodium should go, but there's a concern if the sodium does get too low that um, doing a transplant with a complete total body blood exchange potentially at the time of transplant could result in a sodium that's going from very low to normal in a very short space of time, which will give you what problem? Central Pantan myelinolysis, right? So these people wake up brain dead, if you'll excuse the Irish. So um, the UNICEN specifically made the point about not going below 125, but in reality, this is going to be an important thing which will help patients with um, um, cirrhosis who've got low sodiums and typically have intractable ascites get transplants more easily. Now, interestingly, um, what I'm showing in this bottom thing, which is difficult to see, is, um, but I just want to make the point here that um, people with um, lower melds, for example, somebody who's got a basic meld without the sodium of 15, who's got a sodium of 125, will actually go up to meld, a, meld, a new meld sodium score of, one of, of, of 25. So it makes a much bigger difference to people with low melds, and so therefore will be very helpful in a graded way for people that ac actually need this. Another thing that's coming up with Pike, which um, you need to be aware of because it'll affect your patients, is that there's going to be a hold on hepatocellular cancer um, patients receiving transplants. And the reason being that too many, the, the, put it this way, I wouldn't say too many, there's never too many, but the cancer patients are overwhelming the uh, number of patients on the list and it, it, at the moment almost form a third a uh, quarter to a third of all people that are receiving transplants. The third thing that's coming down the pike, which is going to be interesting, is redistricting. You know, we've always worked in UNOS regions, but there's disparity in the number of organs that are available. For example, in Illinois, or uh, um, Rochester for that matter, um, the likelihood of getting a transplant with a meld of less than 30 is very low. I think in, in Chicago, it's something like 34 is the average male to get a transplant. Um, so you can imagine the tale of people that are actually dying waiting for a transplant to get to 34. Whereas in Iowa City um, and other places, it can be as low as 22 or 23 that they're getting transplants at. So coming down the pike is a way of actually just redistributing the um, way that um, livers are distributed so that um, it makes it more equal. So I'm just going to now reprise what I've previously said, which is how do you manage people with liver disease? So that was just a brief overview of what's happening at the uh, UNOS level. So you recall that transplant is the only life-saving uh, uh, treatment for, ca uh, for a patient with decompensated liver disease. And the, the only thing that needs to be considered about having a person evaluated for transplant is whether they've had a decompensation. And that's based on um, the fact that a person with compensated cirrhosis has a 91% five-year survival, um, whereas as soon as they've had an index bleed, for example, uh, an index event such as a bleed, a scientist encephalopathy, or develop renal insufficiency, their five-year survival drops to 50%. You point out that we're talking about evaluation for five-year survival, um, but your transplant um, itself, once the person's listed, is really looking at short-term six months. So in fact, this evaluation doesn't have anything to do with the MELD score. A person can have a low MELD with a decompensation. They still should be evaluated for transplant. And I've shown here the various um, parameters that uh, in indicate a uh, poor prognosis. So um, something else I'm going to touch on later is that uh, acute decompensation with one of these index events is different from acute on chronic liver failure, which is a much more florid uh, worsening of disease that usually occurs in people with this. And that's one of the topics I'll be touching on later on. Okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. So the um, next um, topic is just to reprise principles of management. And in fact, um, I have a smart phrase. Who, do you people use Epic here, or are you using something else, electronic? So I've got a smart phrase that actually just pulls up this list every time I see a liver patient, which is obviously many times a day. And um, it says, basically, treat the cause of the liver disease. And if you don't know what the cause is, then you find out. Obviously, that's why you work, do the workup. You correct any medical issues, 
you treat any complications, you screen for cancer, check the vaccinations, and you make sure that there's been some discussion about whether they've been evaluated for transplant. So um, the uh, treating the underlying cause of liver disease is really important because it can actually allow recovery of the person. For example, a lot of people with alcoholic liver disease in six months will recover. Um, with hepatitis B, hemochromatosis, hep C, and so forth, um, these people actually can get better from a decompensated state and become compensated and stable and not need a transplant. And there are many studies that have shown um, that uh, you can actually reverse uh, tr um, cirrhosis with appropriate treatment. And um, we clearly have uh, got more and more effective uh, treatment for hep C. Um, are, all you, are you all using the um, uh, NS3A um, protease inhibitors. I know you're Jeremy, right? So um, the new agent that's coming down the pike has really gone through FDA um, uh, uh, in a new drug a, a, a pr um, assessment is um, sofosbuvir, and that should actually be a very good drug. It's like taking water, apparently, as far as side effects are concerned. It's incredibly easy to use, very effective, and um, it should increase the number of people that are comfortable taking care of hep C patients. So what about screening and surveillance? Well, um, these are the recommendations of the AASLD, and essentially it's based on establishing uh, which patients are at risk of developing cancer and then at some cost-effectiveness level. And then um, it's based on the number of life years gained um, and, and um, if one does screen. But the important thing here is that um, hepatitis B carries over the age of 40 or if it's a female over the age of 50, and this is according to the number of life years gained, if there's a history of cancer in the fam, um, and then if there's any other form of, um, of cirrhosis that uh, could uh, potentially, um, they, all of those can potentially lead to, to, to cancer and therefore there should be screening. I just point out a few controversial areas here. Um, yeah, hepatitis B carries less than 40, um, hepatitis C patients with stage three fibrosis or the uh, non-alcoholic, um, the non-cirrhotic patient with fatty liver. As you know, obesity increases your risk of cancer about sevenfold, uh, um, of, of liver cancer about sevenfold. So there have been debates about whether one should um, do that. The recommendations are that one shouldn't, but um, some people have been. What kind of screening is optimal? Well, nothing's optimal really, but the most cost-effective is, in fact, ultrasound as a first line because it's cost-effective, but it does lack sensitivity, um, and um, it usually leads to additional stuff. The problem with MRI, in my opinion, is that it's not only expensive, but it just brings up so many of these um, unidentified bright objects. And as we know, with many cancer screenings, you actually land up doing more harm than good if you find uh, lesions that... Um, then have to be investigated further and turn out not to be cancer. So um, diagnosis of uh, cancer is best by um, radiology, and um, so um, it's usually a three-phase, and it usually shows arterial. Now, the important thing is that, in general, there's mounting evidence that biopsies are actually detrimental in uh, patients with cancer because of needle tract seeding and drop mets. So if you are looking for some sort of curative management, for example, with transplant, and you've done a biopsy, you potentially could be putting that person at risk. This is how you make the diagnosis. This is a classical radiology where you get enhancement in the arterial phase and then wash out in the venous phase. And, um, that, and, and the, the reason for that, as you know, is that the cancer has got an arterial supply and uh, it's really washed out by the time the portal venous supply supplied the rest of the liver. The um, tumor characteristics that we can transplant are stage one and two, which are um, for stage two is any nodule less than five centimeters or two to three nodules um, less than three uh, centimeters. Um, and at this point, um, are there any radiologists here? So uh, who, who knows the LIRADS or has heard of LIRADS? I think you, you know that, right? So um, liver, it's always been stated that um, in breast imaging um, that it, it, it was standardized using the BIRAD. And so the um, liver um, people have actually taken it uh, 
a note from that book and actually made the liver radiology um, standardized things. And in fact, that's a requirement at the moment for making a decision about whether a person's transplantable or not. So it purely depends on the radiology and using the new um, technique. And in fact, UNOS is actually requiring a LIRADS read. So LIRADS 5 lesion would be a cancer, LIRADS 4 would be a probable cancer, LIRADS 3 is possible cancer. So um, moving on, as I say, there's quite a lot of ground I want to cover. Um, the next uh, main complication of uh, cirrhosis is ascites, and the standard management is with fluid, a, a dietary salt restriction. Um, and one of the tricks that I've learned over the years is that it's just about, well, I'm sure you all know this very well, it's almost impossible to get people to restrict salt adequately. Even with the best of intentions, they often don't get it right. And oftentimes they are, may not be aware of the fact that, for example, forget to look at Gatorade and realize that there's a lot of salt in that, or drink a lot of puff with a lot of salt in it. So oftentimes the best way to establish whether the dietary salt restriction is actually working is to see if they have um, sufficient sodium in their urine. So typically the threshold of sodium of 70 milliequivalents or a sodium to, potassi uh, sodium to potassium ratio greater than one would indicate that the person is diuresing adequately. And if they still appear to have intractable ascites, it's because they're taking too much salt, and then you can address that with them. So the um, dose of spironolactone can be up to 400 and Lasix up to, or furosemide up to 240. Indications for large volume tap is whenever a person feels uncomfortable, basically, um, sometimes compartment syndrome, and um, one should replace uh, albumin with every liter removed. I'm assuming everybody does that. That's pretty, become pretty standard practice. Um, what happens if you don't give albumin? Well, you cause um, a disturbance of the hemodynamics. The, you, you activate the renin angiotensin system, and uh, over a period of months, or um, th these people have an increased risk of death. What about tips or taps? Well, it turns out that they're pretty much equivalent, although um, um, a person, uh, the um, Salerno and uh, Flurry Wong did a meta-analysis using the original data and showed that if you do a TIPS, you actually improve mortality slightly compared to non, not doing a TIPS. The problem is, as you know, um, you do a TIPS for somebody who's got intractable ascites, um, they um, have such a high, or it's, it's such a devastating event, event if they become encephalopathic, and, and that can actually be a lot worse than uh, having to deal with TIPS. So definition of intractable ascites, which is the situation where you do the TIPS, would include other persons on maximum diuretics and they're not diuresing, and you'd measure that in the low urine sodium, or they get renal insufficiency as you increase their um, diuretics. Spontaneous peritonitis, just to remind you that it often presents non-specifically with encephalopathy or after a GI bleed, and you may not have peritoneal signs. It's got a very high mortality, and it's, um, it, it's, free, it's frequently recurrent. So one should be doing a diagnostic paracentesis on every patient coming into hospital, even if their presentation appears to be with something else. Somebody comes in with encephalopathy, they could have had peritonitis, and you should be doing a tap if they got fluid. Diagnosis is greater than 250 neutrophils per, high, um, um, per cc, and you can see that's got 95% specificity. Obviously, you've got to do blood cultures as well. Uh, treatment, um, cefotaxime, or um, um, basically cefotaxime is the best agent. Obviously, sometimes if you've got um, um, alternative when you've got culture sensitivities, um, you may want to use other agents, but the main reason for using cefotaxime is uh, it has good penetration, which, for example, peptase or other agents don't necessarily have. 